The sacred text of our faith, the Bible, is one of the most fascinating collections of written texts and stories and historical narratives, poems and songs and apostolic letters ever collected, ever written. One of the things that fascinates me most about the Bible is that it has been used in the most oppressive ways, from justifying, building, and upholding the institution of slavery, Christian nationalism, and to, to condemning the LGBTQIA community and more, the Bible has been the primary tool of oppression. Yet, if one opens it, and reads it, studies it, exegetes it with an open heart and spirit, they will find that it is a collection of writings that depict an amazing journey of liberation and survival and love amidst many human failings, yet love endures and triumphs and humans are liberated and set free. It absolutely amazes me that such a collection of stories that point to liberation and love is used by those who intend harm and are filled with hatred for others. The irony that over history people have used the Bible as a tool in their hate-filled efforts is mind-blowing. It's like a tyrant trying to starve a people but using a cookbook as his sacred text justifying his acts and convincing people not to eat while claiming allegiance to a cookbook. The very tool being used actually, is, if it's ever opened and read and lived by, will produce the opposite outcome of the one wielding it as a tool of evil. That's fascinating to me. One of those evils that permeates society is the practice or the propensity of othering. To other, and other is a verb here, is to group people together based on race, ethnicity, age, who they love, or some other demographic category, and then to paint them with a really broad brush, usually a negative brush, about who they all are and why they put some other group of people and their well-being at risk. This tactic is used to pit groups against each other, causing division and fear. It's a tactic that lessens the power of a community by causing division and having those folk look at each other as the enemy, instead of looking at the one driving the public othering as the enemy of progress of either group and the collective community. And I am sure the Bible has been used to uphold othering. The many stories in the Old Testament of the Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Philistines, the Edomites, the Hittites, Moabites, and the list goes on. And in the New Testament, the Jews and Gentiles, Pharisees, Sadducees, and more and more, and the struggles, even wars and the scriptures between groups are very prevalent in the sacred text. Yet, if we study the principal lessons of our faith, including the first public message of Jesus, recorded in our scripture today, we will see a clear message that is counter to othering. It's a message of inclusivity, God's radical inclusivity. Jesus begins to preach and illustrate this message right from the beginning. So let's go to the text in the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke begins with the birth narrative of both two birth narratives. First, the John the Baptist, then of Jesus. Chapter 2 includes not only the birth of Jesus, but includes the story of the boy Jesus in the temple. Chapter 3 covers the baptism of Jesus, the acknowledgement of Jesus as God's son, followed by this statement in Luke 3, 23, Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. 
Luke 4 then is the beginning of his work according to Luke and that story begins with Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. After the temptation Jesus is ready to begin his ministry and career as a prophet and a teacher and a healer and his very public theologian. He spent some time in Galilee Verse 5 says he began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. He then returns to Nazareth, his hometown, and, tech, and the text says he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And Hyde Park Union, you probably can state this by heart as much as I've preached it. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set those who are oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The scripture says that the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That deserves a wow, more than I admittedly have ever given it. I know I reference this text often, and that's an understatement, but, but I admittedly have placed the emphasis on what Jesus said from the Isaiah scroll and have not spent appropriate time on the significance of the fact that Jesus said, not only that, but what followed, this was fulfilled in your hearing. Imagine knowing that story, the prophecy from the prophet Isaiah, spoken first to your ancestors, centuries ago, passed down by your elders, read in the synagogue, generation after generation, and your people have been waiting for the fulfillment of those words. Waiting for someone to come and say exactly what that young man just said today. Today. This is, has been fulfilled in your hearing. It has finally happened. And it's a young man from our hometown. Wow. Finally, the day has come. Our Savior, our Messiah is here who has come to bring good news to our poor. Recovery of sight to our blind and to set our oppressed people free. The prophet Isaiah said it to our ancestors. Said this day would come and surely right here from our community one of us, as a matter of fact, we know his daddy, because isn't that Joseph's son, who we've heard was doing great things in other towns, and now he's here, the prophecy is fulfilled, and he is one of us. Yes, that's what I call hometown joy. We understand hometown joy in Chicago. The fact that President Obama, the first black president, lives down the street. Yes, his presidential center is being built about a mile away. Yes, Michael Jordan, Oprah, and then Obama. Yes, we know hometown joy in Chicago. I've even seen the similar sentiment, Pastor Sarah, in our denomination, the American Baptist Churches USA, regarding the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. You do know he was American Baptist. Yes! <laughs> By the way, there's about three or four other denominations that claim Dr. King, making my point. We love to be affiliated with the current superstar. And Jesus, the one who was to come is now here and he is one of us. Yes. But Jesus, sensing their hometown joy, knows he can't leave them with that misunderstanding that he's come just for them. They're poor, they're blind, 
to set their oppressed free. He knows he can't leave them there. You see, see he's, he knows that he's come to declare that the greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. So he knows he can't leave his homies, his hometown folk, to worship him and think he's just for them. Can't leave him there, so he sacrifices this moment of popularity and hometown pride by leaning in to some truth telling that his ministry and God's blessings are not just about them. So Jesus says in verse 25, but the truth is there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah when the heavens were shut up for three and a half years and there was a severe famine over the land, yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to a widow of Zarephath in Sodom. And after that, another illustration, and they went from loving their hometown boy to being filled with rage and ready to kill Jesus on the first day of ministry in their town. There truly is a thin line between love and hate. What happened and why the rage? Well, let's look closely at what happened. Jesus gave them two illustrations from their history, which is the Old Testament that we have today, where God favored someone other than their ancestors. In essence, God favored through their prophets someone they were taught to other. He revealed their hearts to them and they didn't like it. And likewise, the biblical writers revealed their hearts to us for the purpose of helping us understand that God is not a respecter of persons or races or class of othering. And if othering is in your heart, if you're vulnerable to the words of politicians that pit groups against the other, if you are struggling with othering, it is, we should know that it is counter to our faith. To the very first sermon and illustration of our Savior. And it gives a new meaning to me of being saved. Possibly saved from othering as the multiple things to be saved from in this human life. God is love. And in the parts of their history from the biblical Old Testament that Jesus chose to quote, God practices radical inclusivity to meet human needs. Let's look closely at verse 25. Jesus says, but the truth is, in Israel in the time of Elijah, there was a famine, and a severe drought all over the land. Jesus is referencing our Old Testament lectionary text for today, 1 King 17, 9, when during this drought and severe famine, God says to Elijah, go now to Zarephath, which belongs, hear the language, which belongs to Sodom, and live there. For I have commanded a widow there to feed you. God tells Elijah to cross a boundary into Phoenician territory where they worshiped not the God of Israel, but they worshiped Baal, by the way. And he told the prophet to go there for his survival and the Sidonian widow's survival because in the midst of drought and famine, they both need the same thing to survive bread and water because they are indeed both human. Othering doesn't work if you need food and the one who has food you've othered. Elijah, if Elijah had said, mm, God, mm, I ain't crossing that border, he would have died from hunger and if the woman had said, mm, I don't know who you are because I know you're not from here, so no, you can't have any of my meal, especially my last morsel, 
she and her son would have died. But God demonstrated radical inclusivity and radical hospitality through the widow and relationship between unlikely neighbors to meet the need of both of them. And Jesus lifts this story of humanity and then follows directly with another, and this one is the prophet Elisha. Jesus says in verse 27, there were many with a skin disease in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. This story is from 2 Kings chapter 5, where Naaman the Syrian had leprosy. Syrians were enemies of Israel, yet Israel's prophet Elisha heals Naaman's leprosy. Jesus demonstrates to the people of his hometown God's inclusivity in times of hunger and disease. He illustrates the reach of God's hand and God's grace beyond a singular people. He illustrates miraculous provision and healing to fellow humans beyond the boundaries of the ethnicity and nationality and even religion. And the very people who celebrated Jesus a moment ago are now enraged. And I ask, why the rage? Here it is. The gospel story early in Jesus' ministry displays people who want the benefits for themselves. We don't want other groups getting our benefits, our good news, our healings, our freedom from oppression. You're one of us, Jesus. Why can't those benefits promised from our prophet through our ancestors be just for us? It has begged the question for me, is there a human propensity to other? Or are we conditioned? to other. In other words, why the rage? I believe wholeheartedly that humans are taught and conditioned to other. For the reality is that there are those who, if they were honest with themselves, would admit that they actually identify with the folks that day who were enraged with Jesus. At Jesus, excuse me. People do want benefits for themselves. And we're told over and over again that there are others who will come and take our jobs, take our food, take our housing. And fear sets in and we believe that and we other and grow in disdain for the other. There is much in our society and in the media and in politics that condition people to have a scarcity mindset and therefore to other, other humans in order to protect themselves. I heard it put like this last night, that there's a tactic to divide, conquer, confuse, and then laugh. It's a very common tactic used by those seeking power. And I don't know about you, but I want to know if I've been influenced by a tactic of division that has led me to other people who are simply human beings just like me. As the American poet Walt Whitman stated, re-examine all you have been told. Dismiss what insults your soul. And in the spirit of self-examination, feel free to answer this question secretly to yourself. Do I identify with the crowd mad at Jesus? And if your answer is a secret yes, then I should let you know quickly that we were among or are among the others that this crowd wanted to exclude from the good news. Most of us, if not all of us in here today, are Gentiles. For you're Gentile if you're not Jewish. So we are among the other that this crowd didn't want included in God's grace. We are, they, 
They want to exclude from the good news. Jesus was intentional to include. Include us all by illustrating that God has already included the other a long, long, long time ago. As a matter of fact, God created, if we believe Genesis, humanity. The extension of God's hand of grace was to the other. It's what Jesus wanted them to know, that through the widow of Zarephath of Sidon, the extension of God's hand of healing was extended to the other through Naaman the Syrian. And so we can be confident that God's hand of grace is extended to us as well as others, for we too are the other. So it makes absolutely no sense for Gentile Christians, and that's just about all of us, to other people for any reason. For people who don't look like us, sound like us, smell like us, love like us. For Jesus saved us from that very divisive act of othering. And he illustrated in his first message, recorded in Luke 4, look around. We are the other in the story of our faith. We don't realize that. We read the text and go about our business, and we don't realize that we are the other that is included. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If I got to celebrate by myself, I will celebrate that we, and we do it well here at Hyde Park Union Church, Outwardly, when we look at the pews, we are welcoming. Amen. But we need to, as Walt Whitman suggests, examine our hearts because there are deeper consequences. And, and as I close this message, we need to celebrate that God's love crosses boundaries for the common good. I'm going to ask you to say amen. Celebrate that God is a God of radical inclusivity. Always has been, thank you Jesus for the illustrations, and always will be. I'm gonna ask you to say amen. amen. Celebrate that God created enough. That God is the God of abundance. That's what communion is all about and there is more than enough. Can you say amen? And celebrate that there is nothing and no one, no group, no other that can separate you from the love of God. Jesus didn't allow it that day. Jesus won't allow it any day. The Apostle Paul said it best when he said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation is able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Let us allow ourselves to be persuaded. Let us not, excuse me, let us not allow ourselves to be persuaded to other. For the Lord did not allow us to be othered. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, that we serve an inclusive, boundary-crossing God for the common good. And there is more than enough. God bless you. Amen.